Hi everyone, welcome to episode 19 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. In this episode, I sit down with Ben Dunphy, investment manager of Blue Sky Venture Capital, a late stage VC firm that counts companies such as Shoes of Prey, Vinamofo and e-commerce as part of its portfolio. In the interview, Ben shares what a good board looks like, creating long-term value, and finding the right valuation for companies. Without further ado, here is my interview with Ben Dunphy. Hi, Ben. Welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Rowan. Not a problem at all. How's your, your trip down to Melbourne this morning? Grey, old, rainy Melbourne. <laughs> um, it was good, good. You know, 6 a.m. flight, always enjoyable. Warm, a warm welcome for you. <laughs> Thank um, you. So obviously, at the moment, you're uh, you're best known for your work with Blue Sky, but um, you have really extensive background in, in this space. Um, can you can you share a little bit about some of the things that you've done? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I've been with Blue Sky now for for almost eighteen months, um, and and in that role, headquartered in Brisbane, um, within the venture team. Prior to that, I spent a number of years over in, in New York primarily, um, working with a, a smaller operationally focused management consultancy fund, um, uh, sorry, for firm, um, and, and that firm was very much focused on operational improvement primarily across the airline and hotels um, sectors. And I think that's super interesting because it's, it's an industry that's very hard to make money in. Um, it's an industry where you're dealing with sort of physical logistics and infrastructure. Um, and so you know, some of the work I did there was working on restructurings for Malaysia Airlines, Monarch Airlines in the UK, and then helping a, a bunch of sort of tier one airlines sort of you know, do cost improvement. Um, before that, I worked um, with, a, with a company called Rocket Internet, um, which is headquartered out of Berlin, which most people know now for being sort of a copycat um, of more successful business models. Um, but whilst working for them, I, I was based down in, in Bangkok in Thailand um, and primarily worked within the operations team for a business called Lazada, which at the time when I joined was sort of trying to be the Amazon of Southeast Asia, generating about five hundred thousand dollars a month in, in net revenue across six countries um, you know tiny warehouses very very lean um, it all be burning a lot of cash um, and sort of as I, as I worked there for the year um, you know saw that business grow from that sort of 10x up to five million a month so so staff go from 200 people to 2,000 which was you know a pretty incredible sort of journey to, to be part of and, and then um, as most people might be aware they exited the business in March of this year to Alibaba for just north of 1.5 billion. So um, and, and prior to that I'd sort of been involved in um, some consulting internships um, and it also started a small um, business as a founder when I was in university which um, definitely was not scalable on reflection <laughs> um, but, but was something that was quite interesting while I was studying. What, what, was the, what was the business that you started? So it was a business called um, The Information Door and what we attempted to do, um, and this is why I was writing my thesis at, at university, was uh, to create a platform essentially or a directory for students that were looking for things outside of just regular academia. So the idea behind it was that um, you, you essentially have students going into fewer and fewer categories of study. So they, everyone's going after a business degree or a law degree or computer science, which is fine. Um, but then the question becomes how to differentiate yourself when you go into the workplace. So the problem we were trying to solve was to have a single global um, directory that students could find out about internships, scholarships, competitions. Um, I think we had great content. I think we had a, a fairly decent product. Um, what we weren't able to do was take that product to market. Um, I think we were probably um, a little naive in, in what was required to scale a business at that time. Um, but it was it was good to sort of have that experience of building something and realizing that people just won't come. So um, yeah, definitely a learning experience from that. Were there any particular learnings that you took out of that? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know we sort of got up to a period where we were getting sort of five to six thousand views um, per week. So you know people were starting to to see traction on it. Um, and people were starting to see the benefit of it. I think what we didn't do was listen to what people wanted, right, is that we were pushing the same things um, that we thought were interesting and valuable, but there was no insights that we were gaining from people that were using the platform. Um, I think the other thing was that we set out with a, um, a passion that was, I think, you know, quite noble in nature, um, but in, in actuality, the way to go monetize that, we had not thought through at all. So the biggest learning from that was 
when you're building a product, I think, especially as being a later stage investor now, it's important to have in mind how do you actually make money out of it or else it's going to be a pretty dreary existence, right? Absolutely. And I want to touch on your experience with, with Blue Sky a, a little bit uh, later on in the show. But um, one of the things that I've kind of talked about with some of the guests that I've, that I've had on, so Peter Huynh and um, Tom Ellis specifically, was uh, the, th- there's usually a lack of acknowledgement in the startup space for what corporate actually brings to startups. Sure. Um, in terms <clears throat> of skills, in terms of knowledge, in terms of expertise in, in different aspects of running a business. Right. Um, what did your experience in New York with the, was the management consulting yeah. firm? Yeah. Um, did that kind of help you get a better understanding of, of what it takes to run a successful business? I think so. Look, I, I think, um, you know, I think there's two parts to that question. So when I think about corporate, I always go back to what a corporate doing in the ecosystem, right? And I'll touch on that. I think what was really beneficial, and it was at a firm called Seabury that I worked at in New York, um, was it gave me exposure to some of the largest organizations globally, like you know, working with people like American Airlines, with Etihad, with Malaysia Airlines going through their restructuring. Um, yeah, they're big businesses. They're businesses with 18, 20,000 employees. In the case of American, well north of 100,000 employees. Very complex logistics, very complex operating globally 24-7. And so what that means is it's, it's a weird existence as an airline because you struggle to actually make a return on invested capital. Um, the margins are extremely slim. You have a lot of barriers outside of your control that inhibit the ability to make money. You know, the idea that fuel is 35% of your cost and you have no influence over that, despite even having a hedging program. Um, and, and so, you know, as we've seen with Qantas, there is the ability to turn it around, but it's a long, hard road. Um, and I think that experience showed me that um, what you, the decisions you make early on in an airline's existence will, um, or any company's existence will continue to haunt you unless you're really well thought out about it. And what you, what you often run into is, as a corporate, your management team's existence and life will often not be as long as a five-year business plan, right? So how do you keep that continuity going across different executive teams that often become the people that are scapegoats for poor performance that might not even be within their control? So I think the biggest learning for that was in an airline, in an industry like an airline, um, where you're going for very long-term views of how the world's going to change because you're building routes and you're building essentially country network flows. Um, having that sort of ability to think 10 years ahead is very difficult. Um, and so you've got to make sure you can do two year sprints, but have an overall goal of where you're heading or else you'll start to see cracks emerge. Sure. And obviously with your experience in Lazada in Bangkok and, and Thailand, first of all, what was it like to, to run a, a startup or a high growth business in that particular region? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it, it was really interesting because when Rocket came into to Southeast Asia, there was really no one else doing anything. I think there was maybe two venture funds across the whole region. Um, there was no real ecosystem. So they brought, as they do in most regions, <laughs> um, sort of bus loads and plane loads of Germans, French, Italians, Australians, Americans to come build out that community. Um, and and it, was, it's, it was an extremely exciting time, I think, because what you were experiencing, and you kind of saw this was, as people started leaving Lazada, which was the kind of the core um, business that was being run by Rocket up there, they started building their own businesses, right? And so you've seen the benefit of these sort of ecosystems flourish. Kind of reflecting on my time at Lazada, um, you know, it was all that I knew from an early company perspective at that point in time. Um, and it seemed normal to be burning, you know, three, four million dollars a month on marketing in a single country. Um, but, you know, it's the perfect example of something that I think, you know, made a lot of sense. You know, if you're going to go build something, go build the Amazon in a web 1.0 world, which is Southeast Asia still. Um, but they were still too early, right? And you can't force that. And what they're running into since I've departed is all the customer cohorts that were required early on haven't yielded the benefit of being returning customers, right? They were driven by um, low price um, and, and essentially discounting. So. It, it, for me, it spoke a lot to a business that, sure, you can get growth early on, but can you make that sustainable growth? Because you can grow 10x in 12 months, but if you don't have the same customer cohorts coming to repeat purchase, it's an extremely expensive game. And I think, you know, what Alibaba is running into now, from what I understand up in the region, is you've got a big business that's turning over a lot of cash, but it's very hard to make the economics work. And you know, again, it comes back to having that vision of where do you want to go? What do you want to be? And being able to make sure that when you monetize a product and when you're trying to drive margin, that the actual model works because I think right now Lazada is still trying to figure out even after burning seven hundred million dollars, um, you know what actually works and how to make money off that model. 
Sure. Um, you mentioned timing being one of the more an important factor in, in whether a business is successful. Or not. Sure. How do you, for, for a first time founder, obviously this is really hard, but how do you gauge timing for them, whether it's the right time to do it or not? <clears throat> Look, you know, admittedly, Blue Sky Focus is a little bit later in the ecosystem, so I'm, I'm probably not the most, um, the, the best authority on this. Um, but I think something that even when we look at, at what later stage founders are doing as we go into new products and verticals, the key to it is to figure out what is a measure of success, right? So it's to start back before you even launch into a new product, a new business, and say, in 90 days, what's going to define, what's going to be the, the go or no go decision to say, I think I should pursue this and, and having something that you're very strict about and then running 100% at that and doing it in a very lean way. Like uh, something I love from kind of the lean startup world is the idea that, you know, when you're starting to build a product and seeing if it works, have a landing page, don't have a product, don't have a service you're offering, just have a landing page, put that on Facebook advertising, spend $20, $30 a day, see the hits you're getting, right? And you'll have an expectation of what you think the market will give you and you're either going to above, or you're going to perform above or below that metric. Um, and it's things like that that be able to sort of very quickly and leanly test whether or not you feel like the market's ready. I think, you know, take an enterprise play, for example. If you're consistently cold calling people um, and you're not even showing them the product, you're just describing what solution you're giving them and they're not interested, that's probably an indication that they don't feel that pain point that you think they do, right? And so I think the, the key thing is to get out, to speak to potential customers, to do that very lean testing um, through, you know, paid social, for example, and that will either give you a benchmark of this is underperformed or overperformed, and within 90 days you should have a clear picture of have I been successful in this endeavor? Is the market there for me? Do I feel like I've got I can ride that wave, or is man it's a struggle? And maybe you know the market will be ready in time, but that's one way to kind of I guess do a sense check. Sure. And, and in terms of so coming back to, to Blue Sky, what are what are some of the things that you look for in investment opportunities? Yeah, right. So look, I, you know, a lot of people ask us why do you only focus on the later stage part of the, the ecosystem? Because we're still a very much an emerging uh, market, I think, in venture and, and just generally in an early stage in Australia. So the decision for us is that we do have a private equity heritage. Um, we're obviously broader than just private equity and venture. We're a multi assets fund manager. And so when we made the decision to really double down on venture um, with the hiring of Elaine Stead sort of four years ago, it was with the knowledge that we didn't want to be another player in a market where we felt like there was already ample um, knowledge and expertise. And so if you look at the Australian market, I think what's emerged are funds that are terrific from you know, probably the seed through to Series A stage. Um, once you get past that Series A stage, there starts to be a bit of a dearth of capital. And you see it similar up in Southeast Asia and other emerging markets, whereby at that point you have to go and source capital from alternative um, sort of alternative means, whether that's a premature listing on the Australian Stock Exchange, whether that's seeking it from a corporate that isn't really invested in what you're doing um, or other strategic sources of capital. So what we're trying to do is play in that market and provide a, a way for people to, to bridge themselves through liquidity, essentially. Um, what we look for, therefore, is really if you think about what's typical at a series A or series B, for us, it's having sort of strong traction in your first product or service. So you can point to between one to three years of operating history and say, look at how the unit economics have evolved. Look at how we can actually make this worth. Um, you don't have to be profitable, but I think there should be a key way to sort of show a bridge towards profitability. Um, and we do have a shorter fund life cycle. So we're a six year fund as opposed to a 10 year fund which means that we're looking for liquidity within three to five years. Um, and, and so that often irks founders a little bit because the idea is that we should never be thinking about exits. And I think absolutely, that, you know, that makes sense. You should build towards the moon. But for any private source of capital that you're taking on, there's gotta be a recognition that at some point people will want cash back. And so what we focus on is helping founders um, grow and expand through the product and services they wanna do and also think about liquidity. In terms of the thresholds for us, it, it varies by industry and sector vertical, we're completely agnostic. We'll look at any sector of vertical, um, but we are a stage specialist. So unless you can point to revenue and traction and economics that start to make sense, it becomes difficult to fit within our mandate. Sure, are there, are there any specific metrics that you do focus on or look at? Yeah, look, I mean, so um, if you've got negative gross margin, that makes it hard, right? Um, but it, it, like, it's hard to point to given, like, uh, look, I think it differs across different sectors and verticals. I mean, we've backed medical devices companies that are pre-revenue, but are you know, at the very tail end of the sort of phase 
cycle within an FDA approval process. So that for us was enough to speak to the validation of the product. Um, some of the more recent SaaS um, sort of uh, investments that we will announce over the next couple of months, you know, they're businesses that are sort of more than a hundred to hundred fifty thousand dollars a month in monthly recurring revenue. But what we saw with each of these is, is really not necessarily the numbers, but there was a clear trend towards customers wanting more of what these people offered. Customers, um, you know, signing up at a, at a rapid cadence um, and really good metrics around payback periods or economics in the business. So it's hard to point to one specific thing, but what we do want is fast growing businesses that are able to do that whilst improving their, I guess, unit economics so that you can see a path toward liquidity within three to five years. Sure. And, and obviously, the, considering that you focus on a very specific stage of, of business, um, their challenges are very different as well as, as you know, the, the challenges of an early stage um, compared to the challenges that an early stage startup founder would face. What are some of the, the common challenges that you're seeing in some of the... Look, I think, you know, they are different and they take different flavours. Um, but, you know, we're looking for the same things. We're looking for great founders. We're looking for great, um, you know, th- that are attacking large markets that are fast growing, right? Um, and, and even when what we often see is a transition. When you get to an A or a B round, I think what you're starting to do is you're transitioning away from high growth, um, often at you know less focused on margins and economics, and you've got to start to really think about, wow, I need to continue cadence. I'm going to have decay in terms of top line growth. Now I need to think about margins in the business. And so there's this transition from earlier stage startup to definitely still an early stage business but one that's focused much more on, I need to make it more professional, I need to make it more mature. And so, um, you know, it can't be that we just grow at all costs or we grow without really a clear 12 to 24 month plan. By the time people sort of reach the stage that we like to invest, they've got a lot of options, right? They've, They've had success, there's clear product market fit. And the challenge for them is maintaining focus to say, I know that I could go after this opportunity and this opportunity and this opportunity, um, but I've got to stay focused. I've got to stay to the core competency that I'm trying to attack because if I go too broad, I'm, I'm nobody's master, right? And so I, I actually think that's applicable back to the early stage because in the early stage, you have much more limited capital. You might not be limited by capital in the later stage, but that focus is critical, right? Because you're, you're typically attacking one specific problem and if you do that very well, you're likely, in my opinion, to be more successful than someone going after a broad range of issues um, because you stretch yourself too thin. So different drivers of what creates issues at different stages in a company life cycle, but I think similar sort of issues. You know, and the key one for me always comes back to focus and being able to, you know, trend, and, and then for us secondarily, which is a little bit more unique, is, is continually transition away from being just a pure st- startup to building out a more mature team. Funnily enough, I spoke to Justin, uh, one of your investments in Amopo, right. about this, uh, you know, the, about having a lot of options on the table yep. and then deciding what, what the right one is for you. Yep. What, um, you know, for, for some of the companies that you're working with or for companies at that stage when they're looking to expand internationally or looking mm. to expand into different regions or just kind of shaping product, future product strategies, what's, what do you think helps shape a good process in, in making the right decision? Sure. So, and it's funny when I was talking about companies that have a lot of options, um, Justin and Andre were some of the first people that sprung to mind because they do have a, a ton of options. Um, and so, if I think about, you know, Vino Lofo and other guys in our portfolio, the critical thing is to be hard on yourself, I think. And it comes back to this idea of how do you measure success? Um, because you can be successful um, across a broad range of categories, I think, when you have a lot of options, um, but that level of success is what really matters, right? You wanna go only after the highest quality opportunities. So what we really focus on is being quite quantitative to say, look, you know, before we go burn X, Y, Z cash, let's make sure that we've got a clear path as to what we see as that something that we can know, or, you know, go or no go on. So. You know, even at the latest stage businesses that we back, it's still very much like, let's go test, be very lean within 30 days within the next board meeting. Let's have an idea of what actually makes sense. So a business that we're looking at right now was primarily a, um, a fairly offline kind of mature style business model and is exploring a really innovative way to reach their customer base, right? And, and you know, is turning over a pretty significant amount of money in that offline space. Um, but what they're going after, we've been very diligent around, let's, let's go back to basic, let's be very lean, like let's test things. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, 
I don't think things differ from an early stage to a later stage. It's consistently being agile, sprinting towards goals and having that measure of success. And that's the hardest thing because I think once you've had a huge successful product, you kind of back yourself, right? I mean, it's a typical founder, you know, and that's fantastic is that they think, and they should, rightly so, that I can go and tack any other market, but it's been very hard on yourself. And that's where I think a good board and a great advisor network is really important. So funnily enough, that was going to be my ne- <laughs> next question to you as well was, um, again, I, I, like, I think there, there's so much that happens in, in startups and running business that people don't understand uh, or, or have enough information about specific aspects. One of them being what an effective board looks like mm. or, or what is the, the specific function of a board in, in the first place. Yep. Um, obviously, you're on the board for a number of your portfolio companies as well. Um, can you kind of share what, what an effective board looks like to you and, and how to put an effective board together? Sure. I think the first thing is um, a board, and we've seen a couple of these, you know, if anyone's in the early stage community and has 10 plus people on their board, that is crazy. So it's, for us, a board is really just a sense check, right? It's a way to offer advice, to seek opinion, um, and, and to make sure that, you know, why we often take board seats within our portfolio is to protect our investors' money and to make sure that we have influence. Um, and hopefully we only do that in cases where we feel like we can actually add value. And that's because we typically wouldn't make an investment in an industry that we didn't know at all. Um, but in terms of generally what a board looks like, my perspective, and I'm definitely not the authority on this, is it should be fairly lean. I don't think at the earliest stages a board needs to be more than you know, four to five people. Um, typically that's one to two at least representatives from the company. If you've raised several rounds of capital, um, maybe you've got two investors, but no more than one per round. Um, and typically what we like to think is if you're at the sort of B or C rounds, you'll have one from the most recent round and one as a representative from early investor bases. And then generally a, a very experienced independent um, director that has great domain expertise, someone that can, and, and is experienced in board roles to drive that forward. Um, I think what you get from that is no one has too much influence on the board. You don't have investors dictating what founders should do because I don't think that's healthy. Um, but equally, you've got founders that have a knowledge that they've got checks and balances in place. Um, and that, I think, actually helps them think smarter because they know at the end of every month, quarter, whatever the frequency of board meetings are, that you're going to be answerable to someone. And that's, that's I think that's a good thing. I think founders actually like that if it runs effectively. Um, but what you don't want is large, unruly boards because you know, nothing ever gets done. I don't think you want people on there that don't have any expertise in, um, in an industry, including ourselves. If you don't know it um, and you don't understand the economics and what you're building towards and you don't have the vision, it's hard to keep a founder in check, right? Because you guys see completely differently on, on certain topics. Um, I think, you know, the, that sort of overall structure that I've laid out typically seems to work for us. The other thing that we try and not do is overwhelm with the number of board meetings, right? Most decisions day to day are operational. That should be on the founder. That's because you're backing someone who's a founder. Um, it's only the larger decisions, you know, things like budgets, things like large capital expenditure, where it's good to seek a second or third opinion. And that's when I think a board plays its role really effectively. Sure. At, at what stage should a should a company put a board together? It's a good question. Um, look, different people will say different things on this, um, you know, using, I guess, the experience that we have at Blue Sky. I think that it's, it's nice to have a board fairly early on, but that will typically be, if say if it's a two founder company, the two founders and maybe one of their advisors. And it's, they might meet once or twice a year to discuss things like a budget or to discuss how things are going. It's, it's largely social. It's, it's largely a way just to sense check yourself and kind of reflect. And it really is a quasi offsite more than anything, right? To take the time to step away from the business. I think once you start to get to A and B rounds, um, when things are expected to be more a bit more professional, that you've got product market fit, and you're typically dealing with a larger source of private capital, um, it's important to have that governance in place. And it can be four board meetings a year, if, if that's what the company all it requires, um, and you get into, I think, a rhythm around that. But it shouldn't be, um, I think at that point, there should be some form of board just because it's, I think, a nice opportunity for every month for a founder to step back, to report on what they're doing, to seek opinions. Um, and as you're starting, as I said, to manage a lot of a lot more money than historically you have um, on behalf of investors or on behalf of, you know, just the, the business doing a larger amount of revenue, if it makes sense. Yeah, I think that, again, in, in one of my interviews with Adir, he was mentioning the same thing. The, yeah. the, you know, the fact that they've IPO'd was 
for him and, and the reporting that goes with it was a good thing. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the constant kind of having to reflect on what the business is, is doing month on month is, is a good thing and a, and a good sort of sanity check when things get chaotic. Right, and, you know, some people look at it as a, you know, I don't want to have to do any sort of reporting metrics or, you know, board packs, but I think if you get into a good rhythm and the board members are adding value, then it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, obviously, Blue Sky looks into investments in Australia and in Asia mm. as well. What are what are some of the 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 trends that you're seeing coming out of the the Asian market? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so, so we're very early in our investment life cycle in Southeast Asia. So we just closed our first investment, but we are live there, and we're, we're certainly looking for, for further ones to do in the next sort of twelve months. Southeast Asia is an interesting market. Um, if you look at it on on you know what they should be doing based on what other markets did, because really, I think of Southeast Asia as being between five to eight years behind the likes of China and India, and even further behind um, the United States. And that's been kind of limited by two things: you know, overall economic development for sure, but really the inability to actually transact. Um, or have access to to online services and products, right? Which kind of negates the ability to do much online. So, um, you know, that kind of places you in a world where you're really at Web 1.0, maybe Web 1.5, where, you know, if you think back to what Australia was like during that, which was the late 90s, early 2000s, it was search directories and it was classifieds. And some of those guys are behemoths and, and innovative, but that's kind of the business that were successful. You've had people like Rocket and other large players come in and start building Web 2.0 or, or later businesses, and the market clearly hasn't been quite ready for it. But what it's done is it's forced through the development life cycle and, and forced through consumer adoption at a far rapid cadence. And then in addition, you've got people going mobile first. So they've never used a desktop, they've never used a laptop, and all of a sudden, I'm leapfrogging to using a smartphone. That in, that's a very interesting issue, right? Because sure, that makes sense. Um, it's cheaper, it's more efficient way to access the internet. But I don't have any knowledge as a Southeast Asian average consumer of how to do anything on the desktop, right? So as opposed to me building a product in the West where I know that people previously used my banking website online and now they're using the mobile version, I've got to build a full feature version on the mobile for people who have never had access to any sort of interface before. So. It, it has interesting differences in the way that you build product, the way that you market to people. Um, it, the trends that we're starting to see emerging is um, there was a lot of investment in the last 12 months up there, at pretty full valuations to say the least. Um, and I think things of people have spent this year largely taking stock of where the market's at. A lot of, I think, the investment happened um, on the basis of reports that had been produced of this is what the growth should look like. And I think there certainly has been incredible growth, maybe not to the level that people thought. Um, I think there will be a point when that changes and you see hockey stick, similar to what happened in China and India, I think people still need to work through the key problems. So what we're focused on in Southeast Asia is very much around businesses that are building the ecosystem in the community and building out infrastructure. So our first investment, e-commerce, warehouses, physical infrastructure, delivery fleets, software that helps you know, do, do delivery management, fleet management, really basic stuff that's an adjacency to e-commerce. Um, because what we're not hoping to do is pick the winner in e-commerce, we're picking the thematic. You know, things that are interesting for us and a lot of other investments up there, things like payments, things like business directories, things like two-sided marketplaces. You know, these business models are just starting to evolve. The critical thing and, and what a lot of people have found is you can't take something from the West and move it up there. Southeast Asia is, di is a different beast to China and India. It's six disparate markets with different languages, different cultures and different laws. So you can't just roll out across the region. Um, and that means you've got to build flexible, really um, intelligent products that can go across all those markets. And that's the people I think that win ultimately. Um, it, it's not the people that take a sort of a localized approach and start in Thailand and then roll it out throughout the rest of Southeast Asia. You've got to really be thinking market by market. Absolutely. Yeah. So on <clears throat> on that, for any any startup from the West, specifically from Australia, mm. uh, looking to, to break into the Southeast Asian market, what do you think would be a good, or what do you think should be that first step? It's a good one. Um, look, I think it's it, it's different by industry and vertical. Um, but what I will say is, you know, there's immense opportunity in in the region up there. Um, you know, like on our doorstep, we have Indonesia, which provides a huge opportunity for I think Australian businesses. But 
what you've got to be prepared to do is, is localize your product or service offering. Um, you know, there's guys, like a business that I know, Fusion Payments, and, and they've taken essentially something that was a you know, Web 1.5 product that was used by some of the big telcos here and then localized it up there and are getting amazing traction. So it, it's people, you've got to be prepared, I think, to localize your product in those markets, but you should do so on the basis that there's a lot of opportunity up there. Um, I think the other thing that people, particularly from Australia, um, as they move into the region, say if you're doing e-commerce, the average order value in, in Indonesia that we're seeing is sort of 10 to $12, right? So it's, it's a very different market. Um, the margins are much leaner, but volume is, is incredible up there because of the growth that people are seeing. So um, the first step, I think, is to go into a market like a Singapore um, or a Malaysia that is you know, potentially a little bit more similar to the West, um, that has a, a larger GDP and earning power and the ability to kind of purchase at prices similar to what would be acceptable in Australia. Um, and then I think it's, you've got to be on the ground up there eventually um, to really make a go of it. I think certainly you can use services like the investment that we have, e-commerce, to get exposure up there. But if, if that's going to be a really focal part of someone's growth strategy, you've got to have people on the ground um, because it's a market that A, is changing so rapidly without actually having a physical presence. It's very difficult to pick out what trends you should go after and whatnot. Sure. I mean, apart from the, the obvious barriers of, of doing business in, mm. in Asia, so like culture, language, those sort of things, what are some of the less talked about challenges of of operating in those regions? Sure. I mean, look, it, it is spoken about, but something that I always go back to is, you know, the way that people transact is, is very different. So um, we're looking, um, we've been speaking to a business up there that's one of Indonesia's largest online travel agencies, and um, they have 15 different payment methods, all of which are, are different. So, you know, whether it's offline payment, payment through bank transfer, payment through credit card, cash on delivery, you know, m money order, whatever it might be, They've got to focus and that, that they've got to have all those different options to capture ultimately what's probably 2% of the market right now. So, you know, the other thing that, you know, if you think about um, Indonesia, for example, it's essentially a group of islands. It's like an archipelago, right? So there's this huge logistical nightmare of getting products. Someone orders from, you know, far out in Medan or, or somewhere else in the region. Uh, you know, it can take 8 to 12 days to get there. So... Um, I think what a lot of people you know, sometimes forget is that 70% of e-commerce orders in Thailand are still done cash on delivery, which means you're literally ordering, you're taking, you're packing an order in a warehouse, you're sending it all the way to a customer, and if they're not home two out of or three days, that order goes back, you've incurred all that cost, right? So it's, it's quite a, it's a market that I think is struggling to keep up with demand through just physical infrastructure. Um, so it's very, very different in the way that you transact. It's not as simple as just putting a tokenized credit card on a website being PCI compliant. You've got to, I think, have um, a much broader play. And, and that's why I think you've got to be focused on making a focal part of your strategy because at the end of the day, you go and operate up there in a meaningful way, you're building out an ecosystem. Um, and that means that you've got to localize and you've also got to um, be prepared that things take a little bit longer to mature, um, but hopefully the rewards are pretty great, right? Sure. And obviously from, from an investment side, you focus across a fairly wide geography. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how, do you, how do you kind of balance out um, the different opportunities that come across? Yeah, sure. Regions? That's a good question. Um, so, so we invest across North America, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Um, we're fortunate in that we have a New York office, so we have investment professionals on the ground. Um, they're a little bit more generalist and a little bit more skewed towards probably private equity, but they certainly have the ability to diligence deals. Um, so we're very fortunate in North America to have those. Um, and in Southeast Asia, we don't have a physical presence there. Um, so the way that we've approached it is to say, look, we each of us in the investment side um, at Blue Sky and the Venture Team have people that we really trust that send us deal flow, um, you know, across Southeast Asia, even you know, further west than that, um, and then in North America and in Australia, obviously. So we do leverage, I guess, a scout network um, fairly extensively where people that we know well um, when we receive a deal can very quickly tell us their thoughts um, or, else or even if they're bringing us the deal can very quickly give us their thoughts. Um, and those people are kind of happy to do so because they're kind of part of the, the Blue Sky family. Um, otherwise, I think we'd struggle to keep, you know, with three investment professionals on the venture side, it'd be very difficult to cover such a broad geography. The other thing that we are is we're, we're fairly, 
opportunistic still, but we do have key thematics that we're going after in each region. And so we're quite diligent around if we don't know a market well or we don't know an industry sector well, we're very upfront about that. We don't want to be backing businesses that we don't feel like we can add value in. And whilst we're always open to learning or leveraging our network to you know, learn about a new industry, um, if it's you know extremely left field, I think sometimes there's a bit of investor that potentially is suitable. And if we can provide an introduction, then great. Sure. Yeah. Is, is there a way that you kind of, um, I guess, choose between different opportunities? Um, generally um, for us it, it does come back to bandwidth you know with three people in the team and, and soon to be a fourth um, uh, down the line we're, we're constricted we see well north of probably 800 to a thousand opportunities a year now so we, we do see a lot um, for us we try and treat every deal as its own and on its own merit we're a little bit unique in the sense that we have two captive funds and we're in fundraising mode for a third but we actually have a very, uh, or I think I would say, a fairly significant LP base um, that's actually not just institutional capital. There's a lot of high net worths, family offices, um, that numbers well north of a thousand, which almost no other venture fund would say, I think would be part of their LP base. And so what that means is we've got very strong coexisting uh, co-investor relationships. So a, a lot of the deals that we do um, or a number of deals that we've done in the last sort of 12 to 18 months sit outside of our captive funds. So Vino Mofo is a great example. That was a deal that was done as sort of a, um, an SPB or a single asset unit trust. Um, so what that allows us to do is despite having limited bandwidth, if we look at two deals and on its merit, they both deserve to get further diligence. We'll just suffer from lack of sleep for a little while because we're confident that if we want to be able to raise money, we can, um, even if it's not out of our captive funds. So that gives us a, quite a bit of flexibility, which is nice, which to date, I haven't seen a deal that we've loved that we just didn't do because we were constricted by bandwidth. It's just about getting the flexibility from founders to give us the time to, to diligence a deal, essentially. Sure. Are there, um, what are the go, no go uh, decision uh, making processes for you when you're doing the, the due diligence yep, or meeting yep, startups? Yeah, so, so um, as a later stage fund, we've got more information to play with. Um, you know, obviously critical, as everyone says, founding team is number one, um, and that's just a matter of spending time and building a relationship. But we then have the benefit of actually being able to go and look at you know, anywhere between one to five years of operating history and, and really get stuck into the metrics and the data. And, and have a better sense because the market should be more evolved, is it trending in the right direction? So the way that our investment process works is we'll typically meet founders and look, if, if we have our ideal scenario, we'd love to get to know founders over a long period of time. She's a praise, a great example of a, a founding group that we met almost two and a half, three years ago, and they were already known to us before that. Um, and we looked at the investment then and, and it probably didn't fit within our mandate and they came back two years later and, and they said, how have we gone? And we're raising a B round and we said, wow, that's amazing. Um, and we've been speaking to them on and off during that time, in particular Elaine, um, and then we made the decision to invest. So I think first thing is we'd love to know founders well before and that means that even if people are not ready for our mandate, we're happy to have an intro call, happy to meet up for a coffee because to get on not just our radar, they'll get on their radar. If they're really successful, most rounds are done internally by existing investors right at the later stage. So we've got to be make sure that we're known and out there. From there, where we basically go to is what we call an initial view paper, and that's a gating process for our investment committee to just get comfortable with the team, the market, the opportunity, and the economics. That's the gating process to sign a term sheet, and then typically it's sort of a 30-day diligence period where we do things like legal due diligence and financials really just confirmatory to make sure that we tick the boxes to say to our LPs hand on heart, we've done proper diligence across both commercial and other elements of the business, um, and then it's, it's cash and bank. So we try and not extend things out well beyond what a general earlier stage fund would do. We wanna try and work to the timelines of a founder, um, but also make sure that we can hand on heart say that we've done the work um, because we do have the benefit of having more information than an early stage investor might. Sure. and. Um I guess one of the things that startups really struggle with at, at most stages is valuation right. of the company. Is there a specific, uh, obviously, you know, later stages is slightly different. You, you have more information on revenue and, and profits and things like that. Yep. Um, is there a specific formula or, or a way that you that you come I to or, or agree with uh, the with valuation? I, I wish there was a formula that just popped out with the magic number that everyone's satisfied with. Look, 
Um, you know, we do all the same valuation work that, that most people do. Um, you know, it's market comps. Um, we don't use, and this is something that surprises a lot of people, but I don't think they're that valuable in what we do in the early stage space, given uncertainty. We don't do things like DCF and other models. It's primarily market comps. Um, given how many deals we see and how many people we're speaking to post earlier stage deals, we get a very good sense of what private market comps are, which is beneficial because they can, what private and public comps will say can be fairly different. Um, the other thing for us is when you're at the later stage, I think the growth rates and, and the cadence and all those things can differ between companies, right? A high growth, really attractive company will get valued very differently to a lower growth company at the later stage and maybe early stage. So what we try and solve for, I guess, is three things. Valuation for us doesn't sit as a standalone one term. Um, it's supported by a whole term sheet that allows us to make sure that we protect our investors in both upside but more so downside risk scenarios. So what we're trying to solve for is how much does a company actually need in terms of cash? And inherent to that is then how much dilution are founders willing to give um, because they don't want to be diluted 90% at late stage round. Um, then we look at market comps and say, does that seem reasonable? Um, is that within our band that we can get comfortable with? And often if not, then you know, we wish them best of luck and they move on. And then the third element, I guess, what is ultimately the Illuminati triangle of investing is um, the terms. So, you know, at the end of the day, things that can protect you on the downside may help you get comfortable with paying a higher entry multiple. Um, so we, we've got to make sure that those three things interact. And that generally means that we both, um, both founders and ourselves leave on a satisfied basis, comfortable after negotiations that, you know, we've got a fair transaction structure because again, I don't think valuations sit independently of everything else. It's got to be considerate of, of those three things. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And so for anyone that, uh, that wants to get in touch, for, uh, follow your story, follow more about you or, or Blue Sky, how can they do this? Um, sure. So LinkedIn, which has my email, more than happy to chat to anyone really about stuff. Um, as I said, we're later stage, but we want to build the community and the ecosystem. So do feel free to get in touch or... Um, my very inactive Twitter account as well. People can reach out. I'm sure they can find me on there. It's just my name. Perfect. I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. Ben, thanks a lot for your time and for your insights. Today. Mate, it's perfect. Been fantastic. That's great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to episode 19 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Ben along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. In episode 20, I interview Paul Bennett and Koshik Sen from Spaceship, one of the most exciting startups to be announced this year. In the, in the interview, Paul and Koshik share the story behind Spaceship and their insight on turning a concept into a product, getting buy-in from industry heavyweights, and the importance of working from first principles. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 20 next week.